Okay, so there are three basic forms that we like to write quadratic functions in, and you might wonder why, why so many. It just depends on the context. Depends what we're doing with the function. So the first one is, is standard form, or sometimes people call it general form. That just looks like that, right? <clears throat> f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. This probably makes sense because we've, talk, we've already talked about solving quadratic equations in standard form, right? And what is a quadratic equation in standard form? Wasn't that just when we had ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, right? Okay, so then the quadratic function in standard form, or sometimes we call it general form, is just when f of x is equal to the left side of that, right? Okay, so we'd say that the parameters there are a, b, and c, right? Those are the values. If I want to dial in an individual quadratic function, all I'd ever have to do, if it's written in standard form or general form, all I have to do is pick the values of the coefficients a, b, and c, and I can graph it. I, mean, I can represent it, you know, I can graph it if I want to. I could represent any of the infinite possible quadratic functions by just choosing those values, by dialing in those three values. Okay? So that one we're, we're familiar with probably. I mean, it's not a big stretch based on what we've done in the past. Next one ought to look somewhat familiar too, vertex form, right? I mean, we just did a bunch of graphing of quadratic functions, and didn't we always kind of do I mean, we actually were more complex than this. We actually introduced the idea of, of a B, which, which represents the reciprocal of the horizontal dilation factor, but we don't really need that. It turns out we never really need a B for quadratic functions. In any case, we could always rewrite it in this form if we want to. If we start off with something being multiplied by x inside, by doing algebra, we could always end up factoring that out of the outside of the of the parentheses and always write it in this form if we want to. Okay, sometimes it's a lot of work to do that, but we always could. So remind me really quick, based on our, our last unit that you were still kind of testing over, uh, what are what are the, what's the meaning of those three parameters? What do they do in terms of the graph? Like what are H and K? Okay, horizontal and vertical dilation. So they end up being the coordinates of the vertex. Good. And what's A? Vertical dilation factor. Good. So this one is tailor-made for graphing. Right. This is the form we, we always want to use if possible. We want to write a function in this form for purposes of graphing. It's so easy to do, right? If we write it in this form, we can always see the function as a transformation. Of the parent function. F of x, I guess just call it P of x. So we can start with just a plain vanilla generic parabola and we can tweak it by introducing those three parameters. Right? So that's really good for graphing. And then the other one we're familiar with too, even though we never really talked about it as being a form of a quadratic function. We've done a lot of stuff with factoring also, it goes back a ways. But when we factor a quadratic, we might even start here right and factor it, we end up with something kind of like this. Okay. Now we'll talk more about this one. Uh, well, gosh, probably not tomorrow. I'll give you, we will start next week. We'll kind of come back and look at how we can take any one of these three equations and quickly get a graph. This one's already done, right? We've done this to death. But these other two, how can we start with a function in one of those two forms and quickly do a graph? It just takes a second to do. It's not hard. This is ideal, but we can also graph from these other two forms if we need to. Uh, but for now, factored form, it's written as a product of factors, right? Remember, factors are things that are multiplied. And so here I've got this constant factor out front. Notice that the A appears in all three of these forms. It means the same thing. In each case, it's the, it is the vertical dilation factor. Right? It's telling us how much is this, is this function being stretched vertically. Only the other parameters are different. 
the V and the C really don't mean much in terms of a graph. This is not a, this is the least useful way to, to express a quadratic function if you want to graph it. The other two are pretty easy to graph. Here we know what H and K are, coordinates of the vertex. P and Q, what do you think they are? I mean, if I were to take this function and set it equal to zero, what would the solutions be to this function if I set it equal to zero? X equals what? Keep in mind, A, P, and Q are just numbers. Uh, if X equals zero, P or Q, right? If X equals P, I would get P minus P is zero, and I'd get some number times zero times some number equals zero. So by the zero product property, I know the product of these three factors can only equal zero when individual factors are zero. Well, A is a constant. That one's not going to change. But the two factors that have variables in them, their zeros would be P and Q, right? So P and Q are the solutions of this equation. Now think about this in terms of a graph. And we'll come back to this in you know, a few days and talk about it in a little more detail. But when on the xy plane does a function have a value of 0? Think about that. Where on the xy plane does a function have a value of 0? Well, I mean, it could be, but not always. But there's, if I think about the xy plane, there's, there's some places, and don't even worry about the graph of the, of the function at this point. If I, if I just represent the xy plane, where on the xy plane would any function always have a value of 0? On the x-axis, right? So if this is my, let's just say, this is my parabola. I know that right there and right there, those are the two places where the y value, where the value of the function is 0. So the x-intercepts, right? <clears throat> Does that make sense? So the, the for, a, for a function that we're graphing, P and Q, we, we call those the zeros of the function. If there are real solutions, you know, if, if this function has real solutions, those end up being the x-intercepts, right? But they're just the values that are going to make the function zero. Those are the solutions of this equation, okay? So if there are x-intercepts, that's where they'll be. I don't want to get, well, we'll talk more about this, like I say, in a few days, but I'll just, I'll float this idea for you. So the red parabola crosses the x-axis. How about the blue parabola? doesn't cross the x-axis. So what are the zeros of that function? Are there any values of p and q that are going to make that one zero? Well, that's one that wouldn't, that wouldn't have any, is it, right? I mean, if that's one that wouldn't, we couldn't write in this form. We couldn't, we couldn't factor it. Right? So we can only write functions in this form. If p and q are real numbers, now they could be complex numbers, right? They with imaginary parts. They could have i's in them. And in that case, they don't correspond to real x-intercepts. But usually, when we write a function in this form, we're trying to get real number values for p and q. And so there are some cases where functions just don't factor, and we don't get any x-intercepts. We'll go into more detail with that in a few days. For now, for today, here's kind of the, what I'm really looking for today is for you folks to just be able to recognize that we've got these three forms of quadratic functions, and we want to just practice kind of the algebra associated how can we transform one into the other? Can we transfer a function from one form into the other? And that's really all this assignment is about. So this stuff is really simple. Going from either of the bottom two, either vertex form or factored form, to general form. Well, general form is the simplified form, right? If we go through order of operations and do all, that, all those cleanup steps, this is where we always end up. So we might call this simplified form. Let's look at a couple examples. Like if we start in factor form, how could we convert that into general form? You did this clear back in algebra one. What would the steps be? Yeah, I'm just going to expand. In, in math, we'd say we're going by multiplying it out. We'd say that's called expanding. Expanding would be the direction where we're turning it into a whole bunch of separate terms. Factoring would be the opposite. Factoring would be if we're going to start with something that's already simplified and try to break it into pieces, right? 
So if we expand this out, that's pretty easy stuff, right? All we're going to do is just distribute. Probably we'd want to maybe distribute the two last because that's so easy to do. All right, let's do the variable stuff first. Simplify the product of x minus 2 and x minus 5, and then we'll just distribute the 2 through and we're done. All right, we'll go through 1 just for practice, but I know you've done a lot of this stuff. So if we distribute, and did you talk about foiling in Algebra 1? Okay. So foiling is fine, but foiling, foiling only applies to when we're multiplying binomials. So really it's better, because we're going to move on next, after we do this short unit, you know, we're going to move on to polynomials. So we'll have more than, you know, we'll have more than maybe two terms in the, in the pieces that are being multiplied, that are being distributed. So really the best way to always just think about this is just distributing. That's all we're doing is distributing. So we'll take the, the, the two terms from the first factor and distribute them over the second factor. So what if we, for example, distribute the x? What's that going to give us? Okay, so good. So we're going to get x squared minus 5x. And then if I take the negative 2 and distribute that one, negative 2 and if I simplify, if I combine all the like terms there, and then I just distribute the 2 and I'm done, right? So if I distribute the 2, what do I get? 2x squared minus 14x plus 10. So, so if I wanted to, whoops, plus 20. Right? So if I write this in general form, it's just going to look like, and I don't have to include the f of x, right? We're just filling in the blank. But written in general form or standard form, this function is just 2x squared minus 14x plus 20, right? Easy. No big deal. You've done that for a long time. What about this one? What would I do to simplify? I simplify and just going top down, right? So what PEMDAS tells me inside parentheses, well, there's nothing to do inside parentheses, but what's the next step? Uh, okay, so I'm going to exponents, so I'm going to square that out, okay? Now, uh, normally in Algebra 2, we'd probably spend some time talking about these factoring patterns, but or these, these multiplying patterns, but you guys probably already know this, right? If I... Question, I can't. I can't do that because that comes after the exponent, right? So that ha I have to wait till the next step. And that's really important. Because this is being squared, if I try to distribute the negative, I, if I did that, I'd get negative x minus 5 squared. But that's going to give me something different than I get if I multiply it first and then distribute it, right? So I have to follow order of operations on this. So when I multiply this out, what I'm really doing the exponent step is just the step where we're going to do x plus 5 squared equals x plus 5 times x plus 5. So you can just distribute that out, but don't. We can, we can take a shortcut. We do this so much in math that we always want to try to make it as simple as possible. So we're just going to follow a pattern. See, do you guys know this pattern? You probably learned this in Algebra 1. If we have something like a plus b squared, what does that always work out to be if I multiply it out? Plus 2ab, good, plus b squared. Yeah, so that's one. Just, just remember that one. And, and we'll come back, and I'm going to show you a little trick called Pascal's Triangle later on in the year where, where you can see that within the context of like a bigger process. But for now, we just use that so much. That's just one you want to remember. Right? If I'm ever multiplying out a sum of two things, then I always know it's going to be the first squared plus two times the product of the two plus the second squared. Right? So what about this guy up here then? What's this going to give me? If I, if I follow that process, what am I going to get? What's my A and what's my B here? X is A and 
5 b. So what do I get? x squared plus 2 times x times 5 is 10x, good, plus 25, good. Okay. So the first step then, if we do this, whoops, if we do this, we're left with negative x squared plus 10x plus 25 minus 1. What's next? Multiplication. Okay, so what's that involved? Distribute the negative. So that's going to be negative x squared minus 10x minus 25 minus 1. And what's last? Good. Addition, subtraction. So we combine that stuff and we get negative x squared minus 10x minus 26. That's our answer. Okay. Let's just get one more example of practicing that binomial expansion. What if we do something like 2x minus 7 squared? Everybody just, you can probably do it in your head, but just think about this for a second. Okay. So what's first? Okay, good, because I've got A, which is, this is like my A plus b squared, right? So a is 2x, and that's being squared, plus 2 times a times b, right? 2 times 2x times negative 7. Everybody see that b is negative 7? Okay. Plus negative 7 squared. And so what's that end up being? 2x quantity squared is 4x squared. I get a positive times a positive times a negative, so that's negative. What? 28. And then plus 49. Okay? So once again, that's a, you know, this, and I'll put these notes online today, so they'll be up on the site. This is, this is a great little trick. We want to use that. Okay? All right, so now next thing. So, we want to go, we're going to convert between forms. So now, instead of going, it's easy to go from any of the forms to standard form or general form. All you do is simplify, follow PEMDAS, right? But some of the other ones are a little tougher. Now, we've done this, though. <coughs> we just, maybe we need a little practice, maybe. So if we're going to write this in factored form, that's our goal. We're going to write this quadratic function in factored form. That just means factoring, right? So what are the steps we go through to factor this? Okay, good. We want to pull out a negative two. Right. We always want we want the we want the we want a well a a might end up being negative, but if we go back to the forms of the quadratic functions, notice that we've got an x minus something and an x minus something. Right. So if there's a negative, it's going to be part of the a, right? Because the factors need to be need to look like x minus a number times x minus a number. Right. <clears throat> so we're going to factor out a negative 2. That's our greatest common factor, isn't it? And what are we left with then? Okay, good. So we're left with x squared minus 5x minus 36. And then we're just going to play the, the magic number game, right? Okay, so, you know, what, what can we do there? Okay, so we're going to get minus 2. Our magic numbers would be negative 9 and positive 4. Okay. Uh, what if... Okay. I had a little more challenging one for you. I should have put some of these on my side. I don't think I did, though. Maybe I'll add some to the next side. So what about one like this? What if we did... Okay, i got to make one up real quick. So let's see. What if we did...
Okay, so what if we had one like this? What if we had... Something like say that's f of x. And I want to write that in factor form. So what do you think? What could I do there? we do in those situations? A and C. Oh. Okay, yeah, we use what techniques? Bottoms up, right. If it's bottoms up. So if we use bottoms up, A times C equals negative 90, right? And B is 1. So the magic numbers have to multiply to A, C, and add to B, right? So what would those be? Negative 9 and positive 10. Okay, so then we've got, we've got to factor this part. So to factor that part, remember what we did? We had these preliminary factors that looked like x minus 9 and x plus 10. But what did we have to divide those by? Okay, we had to divide by A, which is 6, and then we just reduced, right? So that became x minus 3 halves and x plus 5 thirds, and then what did we do? Okay, so we went bottoms up, so the 2 and the 3 go up front. So we had negative 3, when all the dust settled, we had negative 3 times 2x minus 3 times 3x plus 5, right? Okay, that doesn't look like factored form, though, does it? I mean, it's okay. That, that's, that is a good form to write it in. It's in a form that is factored, so we could easily find the zeros of this thing. But it doesn't quite match the form. Technically, it doesn't ma match what we call factored form, right? It doesn't match the form a times x minus p times x minus q, right? So here's my question for you guys, for you, all you advanced math students. How do I get from there to there? What, what are the problems? What are my red flags here? Coefficients. The coefficients, right? So that one and that one, those are my problems, right? Well, how could I how could I get rid of that too? Okay, I could, you know, in a way, yeah, I'm going to factor a two out of the first factor, right? I could undistribute a two. Okay, so if I do that, look what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a negative three, and then I'm going to factor that two out front. And what's left behind if I do that? Ah, x minus 3 halves, right? Because what's left behind is what I get when I divide each of those terms by 2, right? So if I do that, if I divide each of those terms by 2, I get x minus 3 halves. It's easy to prove that that's correct. How could I just prove to myself that I did it right? Yeah, distribute the 2. And if I distribute the 2, I better get back 2x minus 3, which I do, right? How about over here? Take out a 3, sure. So over here, we'll take out a 3. And what's going to be left behind if I do? So I'm going to get my x plus 5 thirds. Everybody agree? Still not quite right, but how could I easily get that form into that form? 
how, how many factors, that it, I've, I've written this in a, kind of an inefficient way, but how many factors have I written in that row right there? Three. No? Two. No? No? Five. 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 What are they? Factors are just the things that are being multiplied. The first factor is negative three times, there's my second factor. Third factor is quantity. Fourth factor is three. Fifth factor is quantity, right? But why not, why not combine those? Right? When I'm multiplying a bunch of factors way back at the beginning of the year, remember we talked about multiplication being commutative and associative. So if I'm multiplying a string of factors, I can mix up the order in which I multiply them, right? I can move them around. And so why not just combine all of those factors out front into one big constant? So negative 3 times 2 is negative 6 times 3 is negative 18. And what's left behind? x minus 3 halves times x plus 5 thirds. Now what are the values of a, p, and q? Negative 18 is A, right? Three halves and negative five thirds, right? And so what's that tell me? That tells me some good stuff. That tells me this function is being massively stretched and reflected, right? And it tells me that the y intercept or the x-intercepts are at where? At three halves and negative five thirds, right? So we could do that. We could even do it so, hey, okay, I got another one. So maybe we'll come back, because I'm going to run out of time. So I'll come back and give you a harder one like in a few days. <clears throat> but there's a way you could even do it if, if you can't use bottoms up. There's a way we can do this and get answers that have square roots in them. Well, I'll show you that later. Okay, so last one, converting to vertex form. Because I really want to get through this, this last little piece. Okay. Converting to vertex form. Now look at vertex form. That ought to look pretty familiar to something that we did back in unit two. That was like unit three. Oh, complete, the yeah. complete the square. Exactly. Oh, maybe. look, we've got a perfect square there, don't we? Right. So the process of converting a quadratic function from standard form to vertex form. This is really just an application of something that we've already done. This is just completing the square, right? So doing that, that's just completing the square, okay? We know that process pretty well. We said when we completed the square, wasn't our goal, we had to get the left side of the equation when we were completing the square. Didn't we have to get it into the form x squared plus bx equals number, right? Okay, well this time we have to be, we've got two sides of the equation to work on here. This is a function, right? So we're actually starting with the function f of x equals negative 4x squared plus 40x minus 156. Our goal is to be able to write this in the form f of x equals that, right? Well, for one thing, this is a minor issue, but I think it really helps. f of x looks complicated. Let's write this as y. So the very first step is, let's turn this into a y. And on the right side, our goal is to make it look like this. Right? We've got to make the right side look like x squared plus some number times x. Okay? So how am I going to do that? What are the steps I've got to do to get x squared plus something x on the right side? In order. Right? Like if we want to reverse order of operations to kind of start paring things down. So the first thing would be add 156 to both sides. Right? So if we do that. Step number one is just going to be y plus 156 equals negative 4x squared plus 40x. Now what? Divide by negative 4. Okay. Now, you're, you're probably thinking that left side is looking really ugly. That's all right. 
That's all right, because once we've got the right side to look the way we want it, then we're just going to reverse engineer everything we did and get that y by itself, because y is f of x, right? Our goal is to have f of x equals something like that, right? Okay, so after step two, it just looks like y plus 156 over negative 4 equals, what am I left with over here? Okay, and now we can complete the square. What's the magic number that I would have to add to both sides to create a perfect square trinomial? Right. What was our what was our recipe for creating? And my goal is, it's right. Okay. So our goal is on this side, we want to get something like that, right? So we already know what that's going to be. What's it going to be? X minus five, right? And we know that because half of negative ten is negative five. Okay. But what did I have to add to both sides to make that happen? Yeah, that number squared, which is 25, right? Negative 5 squared. Now, just prove it to yourself. What are the magic numbers that multiply to 25 and add to negative 10? Negative 5 and negative 5, right? X minus 5 squared. So then on the other side, we end up with all this stuff, right? We end up with y plus 156 over negative 4 plus 25. Well, now all we have to do from this point is just work backwards and isolate y. So what? in what order would I do that? First, I subtract 25, right? So we're going to get rid of this and move it back over here. So let me do this. I'm going to run out of space, but I don't. So step now, once I start reverse engineering, I just go minus 25, minus 25. And so I get y plus 156 over negative 4 equals x minus 5 squared minus 25. What's next? Okay, multiply by both sides by negative 4, right? Multiply. So then those guys cancel. Everybody agree? So I'm going to do that. Okay, so when I do that, I end up on this side, I get y plus 156 equals, if I distribute the negative 4, what do I get? So negative 4 gets distributed the first term. And then what, plus 100? Okay, last step. Okay. And we get it. There's vertex form. So what's A? What's H? What's K? Shut that. All right. <clears throat>